That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Moo Guy, the directorial debut of John Bell, based on an earlier short of the same title. Uh, it premiered at the 2024 Sundance Film Festival in the Midnight section on January 21st, 2024. I'm giving a disclaimer uh, because we didn't like this movie. <laughs> so if that's going to bother you, don't watch this review. What is the Moo Guy about? A young Aboriginal couple brings home their second baby. What should be a joyous time takes a sinister turn as the baby's mother starts seeing a malevolent spirit she is convinced is trying to take her baby. What's your pull quote? For a film with such potentially powerful subtext, the Moo Guy is shockingly incompetent in almost every conceivable way. In other words, this Moo Guy got panned. Oh! Which, of course, is a reference to the Americanized Cantonese dish, Moo Goo Guy Pan. Mine. There are powerful themes embedded within the Moo Guy. Unfortunately, they are hobbled by questionable acting, amateurish cinematography, and laughable plot points. Do you know what the tagline for this movie should be? What? I think a Moo Guy got your baby. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what that references to? From uh, the Meryl Streep movie? I Cry in the Dark, the Dingo. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, this which, was a mess. Which is a tragic story. We shouldn't be laughing at that. This is a mess. I mean, this is almost at the level of the unseen for me. This isn't that. The only thing that saves it is the sort of the, 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 the lore and the history of these children being taken from their parents. Mm -hmm. It completely bungles. Oh my this, gosh. These, I these, have so many notes. These <laughs> metaphors that are rich and complex. Yes. And, uh, and I do think when we do finally see the creature, I think they did. I, I liked how it looked. I liked how the Moo Guy looked. Yeah. Okay. The story is about a lady named Sarah. Mm -hmm. Played by Sherry Sevens. Sarah's a corporate lawyer. She's married to a man mm -hmm. and has a child. And she's also pregnant. And we know that she's Aboriginal. Her husband's Aboriginal. And I didn't know that darker skinned Aboriginals in Australia refer to themselves as black. So her husband's black and her child's black. So... We also know that Sarah was adopted, and the opening of the film tells us that the Australian government used to practice this form of assimilation where they would take Aboriginal babies from the parents. Like, and it seems like it was involuntarily. Like, they would use excuses at the hospital, like, oh, both parents don't have a job, so they're unfit, so we're gonna take the baby, something to that effect. So we know that that's probably how Sarah was not raised by her biological mother. And the purpose was to basically eradicate their culture. And was raised by a white family. Mm -hmm. The opening of the film is like a flashback to Sarah's bio mom, Ruth, losing her other daughter. Sister. Not sister. Or her, I'm sorry, her sister, not... Not to the Australian government who was trying to get her, but to the Moo Guy. Which is the boogeyman. Which we're told is kind of like the boogeyman. La Llorona. Steals children. La Llorona. So she suddenly goes into labor, dies at the hospital, is resuscitated. The baby almost dies, but they are alive. They come back home. We also know that it, it, we give, we're given no context except that Sarah's bio mother Ruth mm -hmm. has suddenly come back into her life. Mm -hmm. But lives far away. But lives far away and Sarah is not feeling her bio mom. She thinks she's like, she abandoned her, you're not my mother. But Sarah's husband Fergus likes Ruth. Probably because she reminds him of his own mother, I would assume. But they seem to connect very well. And Sarah's daughter likes her Nana. Okay. Immediately weird things start happening and Ruth, the bio mom, is like, oh, there are evil spirits. We have to like bless the house and do all this stuff. And Sarah is not into it. But she increasingly becomes more disturbed to the point where she ends up getting committed to a psychiatric hospital. And we need to talk about that entire moment. Uh. But while she's committed, her husband witnesses the weird things she's been seeing and now he believes her. So he breaks her out of the psych psychiatric hospital, which we also need to talk about. And then they go on the run basically to go see Ruth because now they don't think she's on her bullshit anymore. While they're on their way, they stop at a gas station. 
Fergus is profiled by the police and arrested. So now it's just Sarah with her two children. Police who can't even bring themselves to say the word. They try to say indigenous and they're like, indi, indi. It's like, the, yeah. And Ruth, Sarah ends up falling asleep like in the outback somewhere. I don't know. And the Moo guy takes her baby. Well, she hits her head. But... She falls, hits her head. So she's passed out. The Moo guy takes her baby, but leaves her daughter. And then... She ends up making her way to her bio mother's house. No, Ruth finds her on the ground. And Ruth goes, oh, I know where your baby is. The baby is in a tree trunk. Uh-huh. It's a tree trunk we visited in the beginning of the film. And the baby's just sitting there. Kind of like Fern Gully. So they walk in and grab the baby. And Sarah's like, okay, I guess the movie's over. And Ruth goes, no, we have to kill the guy. So there's a final showdown where they build a trap. And we see earlier in the film that there's like a poisonous snake called the like red belly black snake or something and Ruth has the skin of that snake which is supposed to scare away the Mugai so she builds a trap around this tree where circles of fire mm -hmm. circles of fire where the black belly red snake whatever lives under the ground uh... under the ground by the tree that the Mugai likes to visit even though the Mugai is afraid of that snake and then the Mugai gets killed by the snake at the end basically yeah mm -hmm. There you go. Ooh. And the Mugai uh, starts making early appearances sounding very much like the entity from The Grudge, a.k.a. Zhuan, it's the Japanese film version. Well, and all the closed captioning describes the sound it makes as uh, low guttural snarls. Yeah. So we hear that a lot. And we see long fingers a lot. <laughs> okay. I don't even know where to begin. Well, the, I mean, central, what did I, yeah. the central performance, um, Sherry Sevens, who I believe was in the, the played the, the same short. role in the short, I, I don't know what to fault her or the script more. I know where to begin. The description of the film says, oh, brought to you by some of the producers of The Duke and Talk To Me. Both. And I think The Duke's excellent. Yes. Talk To Me is a great film. So I was like, okay. But from the opening scene, I knew that we were in trouble. This film definitely ends this Sundance Film Festival Australian horror platform uh, vibe that's been going on for a little bit now. Because this... <laughs> To to me that this got to premiere at, you know, the most esteemed independent film festival in the U.S. is... Mm. Okay, so Sarah, that central performance, I... Because of course it's giving the Baba Duke vibes, like this m mother dealing with something happening to her children and people thinking she's crazy. And then with the Baba Duke, the tension that involves like... Like, as the audience, we're also feeling like we're going crazy with this kid. But in this movie, I don't understand why they wrote Sarah to be so unlikable. Well, unlikable in a way that we we, do, we need really more to understand more about her feelings for Ruth. Like she has such animosity towards her. Yes. Be, and it makes no sense. It makes no sense because she, she's Aboriginal, so she should know the history of her culture in this country. And it makes no sense because of the rest of the recipe. Like, why is she then married to an Aboriginal man? Why are you married to a black Aboriginal man if you seem to want to distance yourself from that? Already, I think the better story would have been something you said, which is she should have been married to a white man. So her entire life she had crafted to, like, remove herself from her culture and, and her people. Because the reference point you brought up is imitation of life. That? That, that kind of sentiment. Yeah. And then as we see that there's something stalking her and her child and everyone thinks she's crazy and maybe she feels scared because she doesn't want to seem like a crazy Aboriginal woman. I feel like that would have been the obvious, most effective way to approach this. And have this white family be kind of like the British royals, be like, how dark is the baby going to be? Yeah. <laughs> and, and maybe the baby is a darker skinned baby because Sarah's character is very fair skinned. But the way it is, it's like she seems like she doesn't like anything involving like her culture. But then you marry this man and then you have a daughter who is dark skinned like your husband. But there's no mention of her acknowledging, like you already said, why she may not have been raised by her bio mother. She's acting like her bio mother just gave her up. But Ruth gets one moment where she's like, I guess that's what the government told you. But but again, there's no... But she's a corporate lawyer. She should be smart enough to be able to have thought about this. And then the audience should have been privy to her conclusion mm -hmm. at the bare minimum. If you don't want to spell it out and have us witness it, at least maybe a conversation between her and her husband on why she doesn't believe her mother. 
right? Mm -hmm. Like maybe her mother really was like a drug addict or something. So there were valid reasons why she believes the government took her from her. But no, it's just, she's just nasty to everyone. Well, I find it funny. I watched this on the same day as another Sundance film, uh, exhibiting forgiveness with Audrey Holland and Ajahn Ellis Taylor, where that is very familiar as an estranged parents coming back. And you only watched part of that film with me, but it's immediately clear, it, it explainable, like this man felt abused by his father for A, B, and C. And we, we don't need a whole lot of details to understand that. But I, I feel like this needs a little bit more, there's more complexity here because I assume maybe Ruth did have some kind of drug or alcohol issue, but there of course is uh, a reason to explain how that all happened because of probably how she was forced to live. And and I, I don't know, there's just so much richness in there that is glossed over. That character deserved more explanation. Yes. For sure. I mean, because I think of somebody like the character Twig in The Lost Flowers of Alice Hart, who is a woman that had a similar situation where her kids were yanked away from her and she has no idea how to find them. Yeah. I'm just going to start going through my notes. So when the, the I guess the obstetrician who delivered Sarah's baby is also a family friend. So she goes back to him saying like, I'm having trouble sleeping. She's not being completely honest about like the vision she's seeing. So he's like, I'm just going to prescribe you something to help you sleep. And she's like, no, I want to pick me up. And he's like, well, if you sleep, you'll feel like you had to pick me up. So then we, so we cut to her in bed and the prescription she has, the box in big, bold letters says, shut eye. I didn't verify it. That might be a real thing. I don't Is know. it that you need a prescription know. for? <laughs> that made me laugh. Like. We could have just seen an amber bottle. We didn't need to see a box that says shut eye. Shut a name like that, it should be like, brings you close to death. <laughs> yeah. Then we cut to Ruth. So then the bio mother is like forcefully making her way into the house. Clearly Sarah can't stand her ass, but the daughter, the older daughter likes her, who's like maybe seven or eight. And then <laughs> Ruth wants to do these rituals like, Put, put snake skin everywhere and burn some sage or something and rub turmeric on the wall and rub mayonnaise on the baby's at, face. At and the point where she starts rubbing stuff on the wall, it's like, I mean, I'd get mad at that too. Then we see... Stained my walls. Yeah. Then some of the weird things Ruth, uh, Sarah is seeing involve her seeing a girl who kind of looks like her daughter mm -hmm. standing in the corner like the Blair Witch mumbling some stuff. That felt... With white glaucoma. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, I already said this, basically. But, like, the film feels cheap. It, and I think... The, it does. Those moments made it feel even more cheap. Then we keep hearing that growling sound. Then there's a moment, which was effective, I thought, although the CGI wasn't the best, is that the baby, the, the newborn, is in its crib. And we see all these eggs. But they looked bigger than, like, chicken eggs. They're leathery snake eggs. And they, Well, I guess you would have known that. I didn't. So then um, we see that there's snakes hatching, which, of course, freaks. Also, Sarah is hearing and seeing things no one else is seeing. Like, when she thinks the baby's crying and they're like, the baby's not which crying. Which is another reason why this film is stupid. Because as soon as she's in the psych ward, then the husband starts hearing it. But why? Why? Why did this uh, Moo guy not uh, introduce itself to him as well? <laughs> okay, know. then Becky, I'm sorry, uh, Sarah has a co-worker named Becky. Which, the, the shocking thing about Becky is this is Bella Heathcote. What happened? The, well, I don't know her. Oh, you've seen her and stuff. We reviewed Relic, where she plays uh, Emily Mortimer's daughter. She plays like, she's almost like the assistant to Sarah. And she comes to visit Sarah after the baby's born to say, hey, good news. There might be an amazing opportunity for you at work if you come back early. So I'm, I'm just giving you a heads up because maybe you can let me be your assistant. Mm -hmm. So Sarah's all excited. And then they start drink like day drinking to celebrate. And then Sarah's like, oh, shoot, I forgot to pick up my daughter. So Sarah's running late to pick up her daughter from her fancy private school. She's been drinking. And the teacher, who's already been told by the husband that my wife had a difficult, you know, pregnancy and delivery, so she's a little stressed out. So the teacher's like, uh, first of all, we need to talk about you being late. No, and the bruises on your daughter's arms. Your, your daughter has bruises, and also you've been drinking. Like, I can tell you've been drinking. So I'm not giving this daughter to you. And then there's a full-on incident that I thought was, I mean, it's laughably bad. Because <gasps> this teacher, this, first of all, this white teacher, first of all, the way Sarah carries her newborn, 
I take more care carrying my Beats headphones to the gym. She's just barely, so she's holding this baby. Every time we see her, she's just barely holding this baby. And then she's arguing with the teacher half drunk, pulling on her daughter who has bruises on her and drops the baby. She drops this newborn baby and we were both like, <gasps> because she's holding the baby from a height mm -hmm. and then on this hard floor and you hear the baby just go plop. And we, you know, we all know the baby's got soft heads that aren't fused, to, the skull's was, not fused together yet. That was yet. the scariest part of the movie when my reaction to the baby dropping. But what's where then it turns into a thing, the police are call, called, Fergus shows up, you know, so they're able to leave because there's a non intoxicated parent. Drunk parent there. Then they uh, bitch at each other in the car and go home. Why didn't we go to the hospital? Right. Did, uh, is no one worried that this baby's head slammed on the concrete floor? I and then Sarah is yelling at everyone, basically saying like, I'm a big deal. You don't want to mess with me because I'm a lawyer. And she, then yelling at her husband. She says the teacher is a step above a nanny. She's just vile. Her character is so unlikable. She, she was raised that way. Also, in the beginning of the film, we see she got this, like, promotion. She has, like, a male, a white male co-worker who basically says, like, the only reason you got this promotion is because you're pregnant. He insinuates that. But actually, wouldn't that be... She's going to have to take time off. I don't know. That was such a dumb, like, thing to say. And also, I don't understand the purpose of, like, so establishing that she has a hostile co-worker. Because I wouldn't say her work environment's hostile because she's being praised <clears throat> and has a high-level position. And then I think it doesn't fit, like, this Aboriginal woman who's very fair-skinned, who seems to want to distance herself from her culture, but then married a Black Aboriginal man, and then, but then is having the struggle at work. Like, what are they trying to say about her character? I don't know. And then another crunchy bit is uh, Bella Heathcote turns on her during the situation at the school, because she's like, I only have one glass of wine. Becky, back me up. And Becky's like, no. I didn't drink at all. I didn't drink one bit, little, yeah. one little bit. And then she says, well, you know, if I get like in trouble for drinking and driving, that could ruin my career. There are just so many little things that like, we didn't need. Take all that time and energy and explain your damn mama. Because I think that Ruth was the most interesting character. Yes. With the most trauma. Mm -hmm. She witnessed her sister get taken away by the boogeyman and her daughter ripped from her from the by the government. And we just... Well, and and then, all they did for that actor was give her a bad wig. Yeah. I just don't understand. Well, and then using genre as a way to uh, kind of deal metaphorically with the tragic history of the past. Because, again, if they had reconfigured uh, Sarah's current situation with a, a white husband and a, you know, a mixed-race child, and how the Moo guy is really a metaphor that is paralleling all of the very realistic, hor horrible things that happened at the hands of white men in her country in the past. I don't know, it just it just misses by a long well, shot. Well, so that's a good segue to the, being committed to the psychiatric facility, because Fergus, her husband, says, we have to go to the doctor. My brother is coming, he's gonna take care of the kids while we go. They get to the hospital, they see their friend slash doctor, and he's like, I'm very concerned about you, I'm committing you. And Sarah freaks out. And Fergus is like, I swear I had no idea this is what he was going to do, but I agree. And again, it's like the subtext of this white doctor taking basically her away from her children. But then I just don't understand why then the husband who seems like he's in agreeance but didn't know. These two white men immediately pop in who, I, are they orderlies? I don't know what they are. These orderlies seem to have been waiting by the door. To come in and Unless take he had woman. a button he pushed to come and, summon them. And the way they manhandle her. Was, I was howling. They snatched this lady up. <laughs> in one scene. <laughs> they body slam her into the bed. They, strap they her flip in. body slam her into the bed. <laughs> it's. Interesting. For then sure. all of a sudden she's screaming the moo the moo guy is coming for my children. And then I just thought, if you believe that, why are you Why are we so rude to your mama? Right. And then of course then the husband is at home now without his wife and then he sees the weird he sees the moo guy fingers and hears the growling and sees the creepy girl and then breaks into the psychiatric hospital. No, but, he, he comes in, he's like, I'm here to get my wife. And the nurse is like... And the nurse is like, no, you're not. You can't do that. I'm calling the police. And he walks right past her. No one... And we're in a big facility. This isn't some rinky-dink whatever. No one comes. Then he walks by an orderly who says... Like, this big guy. And says... The guy says, what are you doing here? And Fergus, the husband, just kind of looks around and, like, 
checks him with his shoulder, and this guy fully passes out, takes the keys, breaks into the room, takes his wife, and then we cut to them driving away in the car. Mm-hmm. How did this happen? How did that happen? <laughs> Then we get to the gas station, and these white police officers see Fergus, and they're immediately suspicious of him. And things go south so fast. We cut to them saying, like, basically, like, hey, boy, what's your name? And then we turn back around. He's been knocked down to the ground being handcuffed. Tased. I think he was tased, wasn't he? So, I mean, I thought that was a very powerful moment, but the way it's shot is kind of like, okay, <laughs> And then you see Sarah flailing, running into the tundra or whatever, the outback, barely carrying this newborn in her arm. I was so distracted by how Sarah's carrying this baby, especially after she dropped her baby. It's like, maybe you would learn to... You don't have a little papoose you could put the baby... Something, I don't know. A pillowcase you could tie around you. I don't know. Um, There's a moment when Fergus is looking through his phone at pictures of his wife. Yes. And that's when oh, he's, God. And that's when he starts to think something's weird. But the way it's handled on screen is, like, not effective because, like, I got the sense that, oh, we're going to see something in the pictures like every other movie does. But when we finally do, it's so faint and it almost looks like a kid drew something on the chalkboard. It didn't look like a legitimate figure in an image, right? Mm-hmm. Because we see, he took a picture of his wife in front of a chalkboard. And then the scary image we see looks like it was drawn on the chalkboard. I thought that was like, like, he he thought that was a ghost. No, you see the entity, you see the Moo guy, like that faint white thing with that, yeah, that but it snarling looks, face. Yeah, but it's white against the green chalkboard. Yes, so it looks like someone drew it with chalk. That's what I'm saying. Like, they couldn't find a better way. The Moo guy looked like, what? there's an 80s film, I think it's called, is it The Brain or something, where that the Moo guy looks just like that. Well, I thought the Moo guy reminded me of, like, the Wheelers and Return to Oz. Yes. Because it has, a like, a face on top of its head and then an actual face. Mm-hmm. But then the Moo guy has a nice little body on it, which I think is funny because you would think it's like a younger thing. But then when you see the face, it's like Ebenezer Scrooge. Uh, well, <laughs> his, the actual face reminded me of the woman denied the bank loan and dragged me to hell. Oh, sure. Lorna Raver. So can we talk about when, so when Sarah leaves the gas station with her newborn and her daughter, she falls, hits her head, passes out. The Moo guy takes the baby. I don't understand why the Moo guy just placed the baby in this thing and left it. For a snack later? I don't know. And then why we had to see her go get... And they just go get it. and the... That was like a waste of... It felt like a waste of time. Just like when we see the brother-in-law alone in the house that Fergus flees from, where the Moo guy has made a... You know, because he's like on the phone being cutesy with some woman... Like, I don't know where we... I mean, it's like a, less than a minute, but it's like, this is just... I commented on the cinematography. I do think there's one good shot, and it's when we see that Ruth has made a fire, like these rings of fire around the tree. It, it looks like a drone shot it, and then we see it full on, which reminded me of, like, Beyonce's uh, Baby Boy video, kind of. Or Johnny Cash. So I thought that moment was well shot. But then that Sarah character, her fighting the Moo guy, she swings on it at one point. That looks laughably ridiculous. It looks bad. Getting this, conjuring the snakes to come up on the in the burning soil. It was ridiculous. Then Ruth, the, the bio mother, gets bit and dies from this poisonous snake. So Ruth is left alone. And then she, because we're told that there's something they can rub on them so that the Moo guy the can't ochre. see them, which mm-hmm. looks like chalky mayonnaise. So then... Sarah rubs it on her face finally, and then she vanishes. She puts on her tongue and vanishes. I thought that that made me giggle. It was so silly. And then she basically hits the Moo guy with a stick. It falls down, and the snakes eat it, which did look good, I guess, for this movie. And then the final shot, because I saw in Rotten Tomatoes someone said that they said this movie was fresh off the strength of the final shot, which is just a flashback to Ruth as a young girl with her sister doing color purple, you and me must never part. I, <laughs> yeah. I just, there was so much potential here and so many missed opportunities, like so much fluff. Yes, fluff. I'm sorry. I did not care for this movie at all. Nope. What would you give the Moo guy? One. I would give it one out of five. Join us on Patreon and listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>